Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Meet the Candidate Night here at Baldwinsville Central School District. Um, thank you for joining us. And I just will go over kind of the ground rules of how we're going to operate the Meet the Candidate Night. And as soon as that is over, we'll be going into our public hearing for our budget. We have eight candidates running for three open seats and each seat is a three-year term. Each candidate will be provided five minutes to speak. There'll be a timer displayed. As clerk of the district, I would like to remind each candidate that there will be a five-minute timer present. And please keep in mind that the timer will turn yellow when time is almost up and turn red when time has expired. Please be respectful and conclude your statement in the allotted time frame. We will be holding candidates to the five-minute time frame perimeters and the microphone will be turned off after your allocated five minutes. There is no opportunity for public comment during this portion of our um, meeting tonight. Just a reminder that if anyone has any questions concerning absentee ballots, they can call the business office at 315-638-6055. We will begin the public hearing for the budget immediately following this, and the candidates will be called to speak in the order in which they appear on the ballot. A random drawing was held to determine the order of the names listed. Our first candidate tonight is Luz Gasowski. Good evening, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Glad to be a part of this process. Um, I guess I'm here just to go over a little bit about myself. Um, one of the main reasons I'm here and one of the main reasons that brought uh, my family to Baldwinsville is actually the schools. Um, as my daughter was progressing through preschool, uh, I was a board member of Juanio Schools while she was there. I had very much enjoyed my time working with some fantastic people, being able to move the school forward a lot of different projects and um, navigate through some very difficult budgetary um, challenges since their revenue stream not only is similar to that of the public school but um, different as there's a lot of other avenues and earmarks involved. Um, during that process, like I said, I learned a lot and I uh, was able to accomplish a lot. Had to uh, step away after the term was done. Um, unfortunately, she was sick, required a lot of treatment in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, as things at that phase got better, uh, we started looking into grade school, and that brought us here. Um, Baldwinsville was probably the number one um, known school for program in those children with special needs, uh, not only amongst parents, but uh, amongst the network of teachers, therapists, uh, support uh, personnel throughout the entire county. And I think that's something that um, uh, to be proud of. And that's really what brought us here is the fantastic uh, program that really would, um, would support and did support her very well. As my son got older, uh, he now is uh, attending Van Buren Elementary and uh, we've got to know a lot of the staff and teachers at Van Buren and we absolutely love them. And uh, I'm here to help uh, progress that excellence, really bring a focus to the academics and achievement of the district and really push forward and enhance what we already do well. I think very highly of Baldwinsville, and I think we really can capitalize on that potential while maintaining um, our due diligence and operating within uh, fiscal responsibility as well as um, promoting our academics uh, as much as possible. So I'm very happy to be here. I, I'm excited about the process, and I. Uh, open for anyone that would like to reach out or contact with questions, concerns, or anything that um, they have for me. Uh, you're welcome to contact me via email or on my Facebook page, uh, Lucas Housekeeper School Board. That's all I have for the group. I appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to next Tuesday. Thank you. Our next candidate is Tanya Rosado Berenger. Good afternoon. I, I must confess before I start. Thank you. I must confess before I start. I was in, so inspired by the Mary Poppins production on Friday. 
I, I really truly considered um, demonstrating the speech and breaking out into song and dance. Um, however, I, I must confess, some of my thought partners thought that that may not have been a good idea and potentially could have cost me some votes just because I do not have the gift of song, nor do I have the gift of dance. So I wanted to share that with all of you. Um, that production put a smile to my face and, and really, really cleared some uh, clouds that have, uh, I think, uh, surrounded most of us during the last two years, so I'm grateful. Uh, I am Tyne Rosado Barringer. I am an educator, a leader, a sister, a daughter, a daughter to Miguel and Juana Rosado, who are in the back of the room, who drove three and a half hours to see me speak today, who I love very much. I am a community member, a friend, and most importantly, I am a mother. A mother to a beautiful 10-year-old daughter who's sitting in the front with my spouse, Jim, uh, who who is the reason why I do the things that I do on behalf of children. She is my inspiration, she is my heart, and she is my soul. When we first relocated to this beautiful region, we first settled up in Grenadier Village in Liverpool, and ultimately we wanted to settle, we wanted to build roots. And I have to confess, with the type of work that I do across the state on behalf of 126 districts and nine BOCES, as the executive director and coordinator of the Mid-State Arbor, I tapped into my network, and hands down, everyone I spoke to said, Beville is the place to be not only for its academics and all the offerings and opportunities, but because of the community. And that is something, over time, both my husband who has traveled all over the place and alone in Ogdensport, and myself across the country, we've always desired to settle and find roots. And we came here to Beville. And I have to tell you, over the last three weeks since my uh, commitment to, to run for a seat here, the outpouring of love, caring, conversations with community members, you validate and affirm me in so many ways, and I'm grateful for that outpouring from the communities, community members who have been here, who have been part of this process for me. Very quickly, my experience and expertise, I truly believe will be a value and asset to the work that we do on the school board. Uh, my knowledge of the systems that we work with in education, the work that I do on behalf of English language learners and children, it is ingrained. It is part of the reason why I do this work every day. It is part of my commitment to service and to service all children. With that said, as my husband would say, I have a particular set of skills. A particular set of skills for some would be a nightmare, but for most of us, especially in this community, I think would be a value and asset to all of you. So when I think about the work of a board member, I think about what I can bring to the board in terms of serving the whole entire community because we all have a role in how we serve our children in this district. And I see it every day when my daughter goes to Eldon with committed teachers who plan, who, who reach out to me, who connect with me to make sure my daughter's needs are met. And that is truly a beautiful thing. So there's three things I will guarantee to all of you. One, I will always standard student voice and agency when it comes to this work on the board. And that also means my commitment to ensuring that the conditions, resources for teachers and for school leaders, which have the most direct impact on our kids, those needs are being met. Second, communication and transparency. I think all of you want to be involved and it's important for board members to continuously and consistently provide you with as much communication as possible through a variety of different modes. And finally, skills. A lot of the work that I have done over the last three years on behalf of OSAM BOCI and the work that I do for the Mid-State Region focuses on inclusion, including ensuring that all voices are met and heard. I will always listen and I will always engage and ensure that I listen for understanding, not just for response, but also for understanding to ensure that all children's needs are met. So I thank you for your time and consideration and have a good evening. Candidate this evening is Lindsay Atkinson. Sorry. 
almost like being on Zoom, not knowing how to unmute yourself. Um, thank you so much for having us this evening. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hopkinson. Uh, my family and I moved here to Baldwinsville. Like I, I've heard almost everybody else say, if, if not a local already, moved here for the school district. Um, we were a military family stationed all over the country and um, needed a place to settle. And looking at a couple of different communities, ended up settling on Baldwinsville, not just for the school district, but for our amazing village and town. And we were welcomed with complete open arms and appreciate that from the lacrosse community to the schools to everything was incredible to feel welcomed. In our time um, stationed at Fort Drum, I was fortunate enough to uh, serve on the Board of Education at Carthage. Um, that was actually my hometown. It's where I went to school, so it was amazing for me to be able to give back to that community that I grew up in. Um, I served on the board there for about a term and a half. I was appointed to a seat and then ran again and then decided to not run, um, knowing that we were going to be leaving the area. Through that process, um, I'm sure if you guys all remember what it was like when uh, New York State was adopting uh, Common Core and what it was like to sit on a board during that time. It was a big learning curve and a whole lot of shifts and information coming at you, um, but it was an honor. I learned a lot through that process that I look forward to applying and learning um, here in the Baldwinsville School District as well. Um, and hope I have the honor to be able to, to do that here. Um, since coming to Baldwinsville, we've been involved in our community. I've been able to volunteer coach my daughter's youth um, lacrosse team. Um, actually just came from her modified game right before um, this year. So, um, and was involved a couple of years ago in our budget process here. So um, I find it incredibly important to stay involved in the schools and in the community as well. Um, what I think is really important for a board member is making sure that you're able to hear all voices. That a board member is not in the process of, of sausage making in the schools, and that's really up to the amazing administration um, and teachers that are in each building. That the job of a board member is to make sure that there's policies and procedures in place to let them do their jobs and to allow for the best learning environment. Um, so as a, a board member, I would really like you to open the idea or the opportunity to hear um, what the needs are in each building, hear what can make their jobs easier, what's working really well, um, and do whatever I can as a board member to make sure that that's followed through. Um, since we've been down here, um, actually I've come to the Syracuse area from Fort Drum um, for a job at Syracuse University. I have an amazing opportunity to work at the Danielle Institute for Veterans and Military Families. So working still with the veteran population and making sure that they're connected to services that they need in their communities. So thank you again for this opportunity. And again, um, if anybody has any questions for me or more clarification or anything, would be more than happy to open that discussion. Thank you. Our next candidate tonight, Robert Duke, is not able to be with us, so we will move on to Denise Falso. I would prefer to just get up here and speak to you, but yesterday was my mom's funeral. And to be quite honest, it's been pretty hard, so because of this, I typed out what I want to say to make it a bit easier for me, so thank you for understanding. My name is Denise Falso, and I currently serve on the Baldwinsville Board of Education, and I'm seeking re-election. I've lived in Baldwinsville since 2015 with my husband, Anthony, and three children, Enzo, 14, Sergio, who's 11, and Juliana, who's eight years old. Our children are very involved in various school and community activities. I teach science at Fulton Junior High School. I have a BS in biology from Lemoyne College and an MS in biology science education from Syracuse University. I'm a New York State certified teacher in biology, general science, and students with disabilities. I also have a property casualty insurance broker's license. Prior to being on the board, I was involved in the PTA and district PTA and attended board meetings regularly. 
On the board, I have served on the Health Insurance, Communications, and Policy Committees. I have advocated for transparency, respectful dialogue, and working as a team for our students and community, and asking questions in order to make informed decisions as a board member. I see the district from four perspectives, mom, teacher, community member, taxpayer, and board member. It takes a large commitment to be an engaged board member, and I've spent the past three years learning about the inner workings of the district. At times, it's been very eye-opening. If I am reelected, I'll use my experience to continue to have the board and district be transparent in their actions and decisions. I'll continue to ask questions, even if those questions make some uncomfortable. Surprisingly, transparency and purposeful questions from the board have not always been welcomed. This is surprising to me as a teacher and as a mom. We encourage our kids to ask questions so that they can better understand things. Questions do not equal mistrust. I will keep asking purposeful questions that help me make informed decisions. This new normal we have set is good for our students, taxpayers, and staff, so they have the resources they need to help all of our students. I know my vote affects each child in our district and each community member. If I am reelected, I will continue to advocate. For example, I advocated for ways the district could use COVID funding to help support students on mandatory quarantine. I will continue to make sure we maintain programs for kids and advocate for educational program experiences at all levels for our students. I have been a great big proponent for maintaining the third grade orchestra and expanding our foreign language classes at lower grade levels. I will continue to promote mutual respect and productive dialogue with our team in discussing board-related topics, and I will continue to model this. I advocated for more student and teacher support in the virtual classrooms at the onset of the pandemic when there were very large virtual class sizes. I will continue to request input on policies from teachers in our district before putting policies together for board review. I will continue to listen to the needs of staff members as reported in our RMS survey and at board presentations. I will discuss ways that we can financially support those needs. For example, I was a proponent for dean positions that were requested by staff members at board meetings to support student needs. As a teacher for the past 16 years, I have personally experienced the changes in education and currently the effects of the pandemic on students, families, and staff members. We do not yet know the full extent of the learning loss the pandemic has had on our students. That data will be forthcoming. We have a superintendent that wants that data and wants to use it to wants us to see it too so we can best allocate resources to help our students. I'm looking forward to focusing on moving forward as a team with our new superintendent. I'm excited about opportunities that he will bring to our district. Are there additional opportunities for college-bound students? Do we have opportunities for students who will transition to trade school and workforce after graduating? Job shadowing, mentoring programs, other options. I hope I am on this board to work as a team to support these opportunities for kids. Please look at my website, denisefalso.com, to learn more and reach out to me if you have any questions or need clar clarification on where I stand. If you have watched board meetings over the past three years, then you know I have advocated for kids, programs, and resources for staff members through questions and listening to all stakeholders. I hope to have your vote next Tuesday. Thank you everyone for your time. I just want to let everyone know I will not be staying for the rest of the evening so that I can spend time with my family that have come into town for my mother. But please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Our next candidate is Wayne Davison, Jr. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Wayne Davison Jr. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for supporting our community and students and for being involved in this process. I'm sure most of you have seen my bio or information somewhere, internet, printed stuff. Uh, but just to sort of recap, um, I'm the oldest and the wisest son of my parents, Wayne Sr. and Marion, uh, a painting contractor and a stay-at-home mom. Uh, my brother Todd, who is a resident of Baldwinsville, and my sister Marie, who graduated from, Baldwins from Baldwinsville. Uh, they're both respiratory therapists. And my Nana, who's retired, also lives in Beeville. 
Uh, but most importantly, um, my son, who I'm infinitely proud of, Owen, is a senior at Baker High School this year and was in Mary Poppins over the weekend. So if anyone was there, you might have seen him dancing around. Um, my education background, don't hold it against me, I graduated from CNS. Um, but I went to SUNY Cortland where I studied education and communications. Uh, while I was there, I worked at a daycare center as a teaching assistant for four years. I was also the uh, station manager at the radio station and wrote for the school newspaper. Uh, as the station manager, uh, I was able to get a grant for a new production studio and also to get uh, an addendum added and passed to get us uh, a new antenna um, that was voted on by the, the students and, and staff at the community there. So. That was a, a big accomplishment of mine while I was there. Um, as a member of the Baldwinsville community, I've been active uh, through youth sports. I've coached with BISA, the soccer program, uh, Beagle State, the basketball program. Um, I've also coached uh, flag football at the YMCA, Little League, and I currently coach basketball at Northside Baptist Church in Liverpool. I've also volunteered with the Baldwinsville Marching Band and uh, for the Baldwinsville Theater Arts Program. Um, or going along, so I'm going to skip ahead. So real quick, uh, I guess I'll talk about where I work. So I work at Rapid Response. Um, I've been there for almost 18 years. I was an alarm dispatcher, a shift trainer, and a shift supervisor. So I think those would help me uh, in this role as a member of the board. I believe a good leadership team has members who bring different backgrounds and experiences to the team. I think that the backgrounds and experiences that I have gained over my years um, of being a rational and unbiased thinker would make me a perfect fit for this team. Um, I would do everything in my power to support our students and provide them with a well-rounded and diverse education and also support our teachers to help provide that for them. Uh, our job as parents, educators, and community members is to support them and give them as much information as possible so that they're ready for any situation that they may come across out in the real world. Uh, it's also important to listen to parents and the community as their important or their input is just as important um, to add to the student's education. Uh, I try to live my life with hope, honesty, and optimism, and I try not to use fear, negativity, and lies to make people believe what I believe. I think everybody's opinion is valuable, and everyone should be able to voice that opinion, and it's important to try to understand where people are coming from. Um, all right, so I didn't realize I was gonna talk so long. But um, so I think in, most importantly, we need to focus on uh, helping our, our students with their mental health and emotional intelligence by encouraging communication and understanding. Uh, it's important that we give them this information and help them to deal with difficult situations as they move on in life and are, are future leaders. Um, most importantly, my three main topics of concern and things that I would focus on, my three kind of words, I guess, are uh, respect, progress, and opportunity. I think it's very important to respect everyone, whether it's a lunch lady, a bus driver, a teacher, administrator, because they're all important parts of this education system. I also think it's important to stay ahead of the curve with technology and uh, stay up to date with social issues. And I also think it's important to offer opportunities for students to learn, to find what they're passionate about and what motivates them so we can help make them lifelong learners. Um, overall, I think that the Baldwinsville School System does a great job with our students from athletics to history, science to music and everything in between. And I'd just like to be a part of the process and bring my optimism and uh, my experience to help our teachers and students to meet their goals. That's about it. You can reach me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm just kidding. I'm on, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook, Wayne Davison, WL Davison Jr. at gmail.com. Thank you. Our next candidate is Claudine Holman. And although I have been referred to as a book banner, I am not, but more on that later. Let me tell you who I actually am. My family and I moved to Baldwinsville from Syracuse when I was five years old. I attended Palmer, St. Mary's, Derby, and Baker High. 
I am a speech therapist who has worked for over 25 years in many schools and environments. I also maintain a part-time job working with early intervention children ages birth through three and their families. I have also through the years tutored students in reading as I have a master's in reading education as well. In my professional life, I am dedicated to collaboration with families for the best possible outcomes for my students. I am a believer in the district using a balanced, holistic, and fair approach in any content considered controversial. I believe in teaching history as accurately as possible, the true, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I am a believer in age-appropriate, grade-level texts that challenge students, differentiating as needed. I believe in affirming all students where they are in terms of learning and being especially creative for the unique and non-traditional students who would benefit from career and technical education, for those whose paths will not lead them to college, as well as providing more AP opportunities for those who could be challenged by them. I believe that every minute of our kids' day matters. I do not believe any sexuality and gender exploration content are appropriate for elementary school. While of course we need to support students who may have struggles, our main focus should be the three R's. Okay, so back to the book banner. I remember growing up and my dad, who's actually in the back too, repeatedly teaching my brother, sisters, and I a life lesson. There are always two sides to every story, so do not judge based on only hearing one side. We can apply this wisdom to controversial issues, but also in what has been said about me during the selection process. Book banning is not a possibility in our district. There are procedures and policies in place to request reviews for text one may oppose. Have I followed the district process to request to have reviews done as the policy states on two texts in the district? Yes, absolutely, I have done so, respectfully and decently. I have read each of those texts cover to cover. Many don't realize this, but sometimes the board is tasked with approving several texts at once which does not allow time for thorough reading. They don't always read all the text. I can assure you I will. Just as any parent or community member can do the same, I follow the district process to do place to place requests for review. Based on my family values that are the foundation of our existence, I oppose these texts because of significant profanity and explicit sexual scenes. In addition, these texts are, in my opinion, not representative of what, excellent, of what is excellent for our kids, as the Lexile level for one was four to five years below the age for which it was being used. The other text is deeply dark and filled with hopelessness. Why in a world where we are so concerned about our kids' social, emotional, and mental health would we advocate the use of such a text? In Baldwinsville and in the U.S., we can speak opposing opinions and persist and advocating for excellence. How my request to review two texts has turned into slanderous names and descriptions, I do not understand. I have been called anti-diversity, <coughs> equity, and inclusion. Isn't part of diversity the diversity of thought? My husband and I are members of the DEI community group. May I have and voice a different opinion than others without being called names? Can I describe texts that contain what I and many others would consider pornography? Pornography. As an aside, please contact me through Facebook anytime if you would like excerpts from the text that I and many other districts parent, district parents have objected to. I can just about guarantee you that you would not want your child reading them. I am committed to creativity, collaboration, and a classic education to provide the best learning experiences for all students. We want our kids to thrive in this country, in this world, being able to compete with others in their chosen fields. I want to support our kids in leading successful and independent lives with a confidence of who they are in life and what their purposes are. I would like to play a role in the progress in our district report card. I would like to play a role in teaching our kids the truth as well as the multiple perspectives that surround controversial topics. I would love to play a supporting role for all students. It's my turn. Okay. All right, thank you. Our next candidate is Sam Sherry Schrader.
Hi, my name is Sam Schraven, and I'm running for a seat for the Board of Education. Um, I've lived here for 40 years with my husband, Tom, and my two kids graduated from Baldwinsville along with my husband, and I've worked in the district for 27 years. I want to thank um, the Baldwinsville School District, the Board of Education, everyone here tonight, and those watching at home for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I am proud to be a former employee of our district. I support all students. I support and trust our professionals to develop and implement curriculum programs for all of our kids in, in order for them to be critical thinkers. Next week, when you vote yes for the budget and propositions, you will have the opportunity to support the students of Baldwinsville. The capital project can be the beginning of creating new opportunities for the students. With the age and condition of some of our spaces, um, transparent conversations need to be had while always being fiscally responsible to our taxpayers and our community. The new space at Derby can be exciting for all students and hopefully the discussion continues on how to deliver the best education in Baldwinsville. Some options to consider. Growing our pre-K program for all those that are eligible to attend. More STEM classrooms. Continuation of mental wellness guidance. Growing of current and new curriculum. Increasing technology. More hands-on classes. Consumer science courses continuation of college prep curriculum, promoting, always promoting, a safe learning environment for all students, possibly vocational training, internships, all while maintaining our current facilities, and encouraging our students to enjoy music, athletics, arts, intramural, and clubs for all of our kids in order to educate the whole child. I believe in continuing with funding the future. It is for our kids and it in lines with the district's mission and vision statements and the strategic goals while promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion for all. We need to continue work on education excellence, working with our families and community in Baldwinsville, and for the goal for all students to reach their full potential. All of this will bring the district together Communicating is the key for parents, students, staff, and the Baldwinsville community. It is an important goal and needs to remain focused so that there is understanding and partnership within the educational process. We must never lose sight of the child and the goals that we have for students. For those of you that don't know me, I've had the opportunity to work with students and families for 27 years. Whether job coaching with students in community businesses, reteaching geometry classes, taking kids to Special Olympics, or to Syracuse home to visit residents at Christmas time, or having the Baldwinsville girls lacrosse team hang out with my kids at friend to friend and making sure that they were included. Um, my my kids, as I often refer them to, they are they they have made me who I am today. Hopefully you will give me the opportunity to continue to support all kids. Um, I want to thank you for listening tonight, and I also want to um, have a special shout out to all the special champions next week that are participating in their games and track events on Monday. So good luck to all of you. Thank you. We will now be proceeding into our budget hearing and capital project hearing. Throughout the budget hearing, um, district leadership will take questions from the public during the presentation. If you have a question, we kindly request that you come forward to the table sitting right here in front of me and where the microphone is located to ask your questions. This will ensure that those attending virtually will be able to hear your questions. Thank you. And we will pause briefly as we have some people exiting the room before we start the presentation. So what we would like to do this evening is, is go through our budget proposal, and it's obviously at a public hearing. My name is Jason Thompson, the school superintendent here in Baldwinsville. And we will move right on to our strategic goals. 
So really, this is these are our guiding principles as a school district. Uh, I'm not going to read through every every slide. Um, however, you know it, we we were, we want to make sure that all of the needs of our students are met um, across the board, academically, socially, um, and working together. We want to promote uh, collaboration, innovation, uh, cultural awareness to prepare all of our students for the future. Uh, we certainly want to ensure all equal access and opportunities, and, and that's part of it. You know, approving the budget is is trying to always do a good job better and try to get better and better every day. And we accomplish these goals together um, as a community. And that's board members, that's teachers, that's all of us working together. And when we work together, magical things can happen. And you, you know, you heard some of the candidates this evening highlight a lot of our uh, accomplishments and, and what we're known for. And we just want to expand upon that. And we, we need to do that together as a team. So to talk a little bit about the budget development process, we, we have uh, community input uh, with several committees, um, making recommendations for additions and reductions uh, in staff and, and, and sometimes in programming, or we need to adjust programming that, 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 that's antiquated and provide uh, programming that's more relevant uh, for our students' needs and, and their future. Um, we certainly determine the appropriate amount of reserves to fund the budget that will be used to support the budget. We determine staffing, uh, various needs, and various mandates. And you, you heard uh, some of the candidates uh, talk about data-driven. And, and again, I want to promote uh, our, our data, or excuse me, our district report card, which is live. People can see it, and it's really talking about what does that story tell, and, and what, what are our needs. So we're really data-driven. And um, you know it's about improving and maintaining and enhancing student programs, uh, especially their opportunities. And finally, really, we want to develop a budget where the tax levy does not exceed the tax cap. We, we certainly don't want to do something that we can't afford and not be short-sighted. We want to be sure we look as far ahead as we possibly can um, and, and be prepared. That the worst thing you can do is, is be unprepared. And I can assure you, we have a team that is looking at the future and, and trying to move us forward. Okay, please. So some of the major budget influences that we, we talk about during the process are obviously our revenues, the tax cap that's been in play for a number of years now. State aid took a little different turn this year with the new governor and having a very odd time budget, which was helpful for us to be able to adopt our, our budget early as a district. So we did get some additional foundation aid. We were one of the districts that has not been funded over the past few years with the additional foundation aid uh, based on a number of criteria that the state took a look at. So we were fortunate to get an additional $3.6 in foundation aid this year, and we'll, we're looking at another bump again next year. Some of the major things that we talk about when we're looking at increased cost is we are a people industry. So well over 75% of our budget is really salaries and benefits, which is all employee driven. And we have been looking a lot at a fund balance management plan that comes to the board in July that gets um, reviewed in, by the audit committee and then we bring that forward, and which also includes a multi-year financial plan for the district. So our tax uh, cap this year was 2.28, as Superintendent Thompson mentioned, we stayed within that cap. Um, this is the cap, tax cap calculation. Um, and what that really means is when we start looking at the tax rate increase, the, the tax rates have um, historically been estimated and then they come in less, which is what this slide is really representing. And the reason for that is because our assessments have continued to go up either by reassessment or by new build in the district. So when people are talking about their property assessments going up by a certain percentage, say 14 or 15 percent, your tax bill is not necessarily going to go up in that same percentage. And that's because we have a tax levy that we set, the tax levy is the tax levy, and then we push it over the assessed values that we have within our district. That's why the tax rate per thousand that we're looking at here has 
but actually below what we predicted the last few years, and we anticipate that to happen again. Unfortunately, everything that we're talking about, everything that's in the newsletter in regards to tax rates is a projection. We do not have the full property assessed values until at least July. So that's why you'll see changes, or we see these changes as indicated here, that that tax rate per thousand is actually reduced. If you take a look in the hive, we did try to provide a calculation to show you basically if you plugged in your property value assessment, you can figure out what the tax rate that we're projecting would be in regards to your tax bill. That's not taking into account STAR. There's two different STAR programs now and that gets really complicated whether you're a newer homeowner or somebody that's lived in your home for a long time. And really that's something that you need to work with the state on in regards to applying for those programs. So if we move into our appropriations, I'll turn it over to uh, Joe. All right, so in New York State, we are required to present uh, our budget. Uh, they refer to it as a three-part budget, the program, capital, and administrative components. As you can see, we're going to the taxpayers with just under a $119 million budget, which represents a 3.99% uh, budget to budget increase from the 21-22 school year. Uh, the percentage change that's listed here, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about the administrative budget and why you see an 8.03% increase. Um, program component, the 4.25% increase, and Kim will talk about the capital um, component of our budget. So as we shift to the program component, um, I like to refer to this as uh, involving students. So when you think of any area of uh, our school interaction that deals with the instruction um, this, and supervision of students, it really falls within the program component. Um, as you see, the regular school day, that is all the instructional salaries for our uh, teachers and teaching assistants. Technology, AV library is supporting our technology needs within the district. Students with Disabilities is our special education programming, athletics, staff development, pupil transportation, students with disabilities summer program, and our employee benefits related to all those that serve in that instructional role. Uh, this budget does include uh, or maintains the uh, instructional staff from the prior year. It also includes additional staff that we're proposing in this budget one being a secondary mathematics teacher, a secondary special education teacher, and two elementary uh, school counselors, guidance counselors that will serve uh, our uh, buildings. The overall uh, instructional or program component represents 78% of our, our overall budget. Again, as I highlighted before, it is about students, and so we want that portion to be obviously the uh, most significant portion of, of our budget. The capital component, the first category, facilities expenses. This includes all of our staff that help maintain our facilities from custodians to people that help us plow in addition to all of the expenses such as paper towels, anything related to the supplies for disinfecting, cleaning, and so forth. The debt service that has to do with our capital projects um, and our buses, and those are all funded over a period of time, and also we generate aid on those based on the expense that we spend. We get aid back over different periods of time, depending on if you're talking about buses or our capital projects. And the refunded property taxes, if there's a change in assessments during the year, and we have to make an adjustment based on what the towns provide to us. And again, this section of employee benefits is strictly for the, those people that we were talking about in regards to buildings and grounds and taking care of our, our buildings. So you can see here that there was a slight decrease. Basically, it's just a shift because programming went up, so this area came down. The other thing that I'll point out is we do always uh, include a $100,000 capital project. This year, we're proposing that we would do some work over at Reynolds Elementary School in regards to the communication systems, as well as some site work. One of the things that we've been experiencing is more parents are driving students to school, 
and which is helpful in regards to the bus driver shortage, but is also creating some additional struggles and drop off and pick up time. So we've been looking at a few of our elementary schools to see how we can shift things around to make that um, more acceptable to both our bus drivers and to our parents that are coming back and forth. So we've moved to the administrative component of the budget. I'll highlight uh, the fact that the dollar allocation of $56,000 for the board district meetings. Just want to point out the board does not get paid, um, but this is for training and it also uh, is funding set aside for graduation ceremonies and other uh, events that would be uh, at the discretion of the board. Uh, central administrative uh, services includes the business office, human resources, office of the superintendent, records management, office of curriculum instruction, all of our um, instructional directors across the district, uh, supervision, uh, regular school supervision, you'll see a pretty uh, large uh, change there. Um, that is all of our assistant principals and principals. One point I would like to highlight is that uh, in the, the most recent approved uh, contract, we have shifted the um, assistant principals from 11 month employees to 12 month employees. So hence the, the change in the uh, budgeted amount there based on uh, salary changes for those individuals. There's category set aside for property casualty liability insurance, BOCES administrative charge. Uh, we, we are part of a BOCES consortium and therefore uh, there's increases uh, occasionally uh, based on the needs of, of the region. Uh, we also have purchased uh, five maps, which is a software system that will help us uh, better manage and uh, review data to provide recommendations to the Board of Education when it comes to uh, funding the future and, and future uh, improvement projects within the district. And then certainly, last but not least, the employee benefits associated with uh, those that are within the supervision um, bargaining units. As I mentioned before, uh, there is an increase, uh, but when you look at the percentage of the budget as, it, as compared to uh, the 21-22 school year to what we're proposing in 22-23, there's really not that large of a significant change uh, when you take into consideration the overall budget and the percentage that this component represents. Uh, with that, we'll move to the revenues portion and I'll turn it back over to Kim. So the estimated revenues, and you'll see in the, the budget newsletter as well, there's a number of categories that make up a small portion of our revenues that come in. The um, in lieu of taxes, those are payments in lieu of taxes, those are agreements that are signed and approved in regards to frequently when um, someone is moving into our area and they're looking for, for taxes to be reduced initially. And that's something that actually plays a part in our tax cap calculation. County sales tax obviously has gone down a little bit. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these categories. Uh, the one thing I will point out is the rental income looks like it has gone up. We're actually just kind of realigning things to match what we're actually getting in is all everything that we're doing right now are projections, right? We're projecting our budget, we're projecting our revenue. So every year when we go to plan the next year, we take a look at where we are with those numbers and we try to align them to get them closer for the next year. Here you'll see I mentioned earlier, we talked about the state aid increasing. What I want to point out with state aid is really, you can kind of put this into two buckets. You can put this into expense-driven aid and just state aid that we get. So that foundation increase that we got is state aid that comes to us that doesn't necessarily have to have an expense attached to it from the prior year. The other things that we're talking about, like transportation aid, and the capital project aid or the aid for our buses, those are things in the BOCES aid, those are categories where we have to spend that money the year before and then it generates aid for the next year coming back in. Um, so just to, to point that out, our, our building aid, you can see that here where it's highly aidable. Um, the majority of our projects are aidable. Um, I didn't mention that with the Reynolds project, but we are well above 80%. So for every dollar we spend on a capital project, and we'll get into this more when we go through the, the capital project hearing after this presentation, about how that works with how much aid is generated back and how it impacts the local shift. And then you have your tax levy there, and then we'll move on to um, talk about the estimated tax rate a little bit. I think I jumped ahead. And um, just as a summary here, the budget to budget increases 3.99%. 
Our tax cap is 2.28, which we are within. We're asking the taxpayers to approve. And just to point out, the consumer price index um, during the calendar year of 2021 is 7%, and the link is there of where we got that data from. If voters do not approve the budget, there's a, a few different options. Uh, we can put the same, the board can choose to put the same budget back before the voters. And we can reduce the budget and ask the voters to approve that. Or we can go directly to a contingent budget. A contingent budget is uh, explained here in regards to the fact that there's some strings attached to that. We have to revert back to what our tax levy was last year. So that's at a reduction of about $1.4 million. In expenses obviously because we have to have the expenses and the revenues match um, so that would impact not purchasing things and the community and people using our facilities would have to pay for that thank you Kim so for this uh, this year's budget vote um, we have several pro propositions so uh, please Please pay uh, close attention, and each proposition is, is extremely important. Um, so as Kim alluded to, this is a 3.99 proposed spending plan increase with a total of $118,937,347. So proposition two is student transport vehicles, and as you know, this is the, the bus proposition. Um, the district, we're continuing to its annual bus purchase and replacement program. The above amount, uh, we're going to purchase 14 student transport vehicles, and that's to put us back on, on, on an appropriate cycle. I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit. But again, as Kim you know, talked about, there's eight. We get eight back. So we get 81% um, back on, on, uh, on, on every dollar we spend. So you're really looking at 19 cents is what it will cost us. Um, if, you, if you break it down per dollar. So if, if we go to the estimated annual local share, um, the total maximum cost is $1,760 million. And the local, uh, excuse me, the, the local share is essentially $334,400. So if you break that down with the aid, it really costs us um, Sixty-six thousand eight hundred eighty dollars. So we're getting one point seven million worth of vehicles, and it really costs us sixty-six thousand and change. Um, buses are paid for over five years, and anticipated aid is also paid over five years, keeping the local share stable. And this is all. This isn't just pulled out of the air, right? We had a, a transportation efficiency study that we. Um, are, are currently working with, and the analysis says that, that this is the most cost-effective way to do this for our community, and I agree. Proposition three uh, is our capital project, and I, I know over the um, past few years, you know, prior to my arrival, there were several studies with funding the future, and of course we know that COVID hit, and kind of stalled everything and just turned the world upside down. Um, so what we did as collectively as a team and as a board, um, we, we went back to the drawing board and figured out a, a, a long-term plan. So this is, this is really just step one or phase one, which is why it's so critical that we get this first project off the ground. And then as we, as we move forward, you'll see more projects, more improvement, um, to uh, help aid and, and uh, I want to say aid and repair, but we have a, our infrastructure is, is aging, and we, we we need this. We really need this project. Um, so the total cost is is thirty two million eight hundred thousand dollars. So. Again, we go on to uh, Proposition 3, capital project, total maximum cost, $32,800,000. Um, the total share, um, again, I won't read through everything, but you can see that breakdown. Um, for every 100000 we spend, we get 86408 in 21-22. 22-23, we get 
87.9% uh, back in aid, or 87,900. The vocal share is 13,600 for 100,000 in work, or 12,100 with the 22-23 aid ratio when fully aided. Again, as I said, we have lots of propositions up. So, um, you know, like I said, they're all extremely important. So the next one is to establish a capital reserve, um, which, which will help offset the cost of, of future building projects. And as I said, this is phase one. We're gonna have several phases uh, following up as we move along. We're utilizing five million, so we'll have $2,481,697 remaining in the capital reserve. So again, talking about planning for the future, we're not short-sighted, we're, we're looking forward, and we have to plan appropriately. <coughs> Proposition five is an acquisition of land, and the total per co purchase cost is $10,000. And the property is, is located in Van Buren, but it's actually at the McNamara School. And what this is going to do is, is we're able to um, create a bus loop, which is more efficient and it's safer for our children, safer for our staff. And at the end of the day, again, to go back to Kim's point, it's, it's, we're gonna get 87.9% uh, in state aid. So the actual cost, um, will be a local impact of $1,210 after everything's all said and done. So, and, and again, that, that's obviously, for us, that's a great deal, and it, it'll fulfill a need that, uh, that we need for, for the bus loop at, at McNamara. And uh, again, the, the 2022 to, 20, to, to 2023 budget vote, is Tuesday, May 17th, 2022, and the polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., and it's located at the District Operations Building um, on our main campus. And if you don't know where that is, please give us a call and, and we'll, we'll help direct you uh, to where, where to find us. So we'll now move into our proposed capital project portion of our meeting. And uh, if people have been following us, they know we have been talking about this for some time with our Board of Education. The first slide we'll take a look at is, is a kind of a summary of what we're looking at, which I'll go over quickly, and then I'll pass it on to Jason and Joe to discuss the instructional benefits, and then I'll discuss uh, the financial piece of it near the end of the, the presentation. So as you see here, we are proposing to build a new gymnasium within um, the courtyard of the current building and part of the reason that was thought out like that is because we wanted to preserve all of our green space outside of that building not knowing where we will be going for the future for our next project as um, superintendent alluded to earlier in addition to that we will then be able to utilize our current gym as a cafeteria and we have some pictures our current cafeteria is really not large enough for the number of students that we have so that's kind of what you're sh seeing shift the other addition would be a small STEM uh, classroom addition that would be put on the media center. So then that would also allow us to create a new entrance where you see the arrow. That would kind of be a central location where we would have guidance and um, the principals and the nursing all in kind of one stop. If you've been to Derby, you realize we don't really have a main entrance. We have an entrance that we utilize on a regular basis, but it's not really a true main entrance like we might have at other, uh, other buildings in our district. So I'll turn it over to Jason and Joe. Thank you, Kim. So this is this is where we start to get really excited because you know it's, it's about creating opportunities, right, and, and looking forward to the future. And I'm, I'm so very pleased that our board was very active and touring all the buildings and really getting a sense firsthand of the true needs and hearing our teachers and seeing students interact and in buildings that need to be updated. So it really gave the board um, a very good perspective and understanding of, of what our needs are. Um, you know, again, I, I don't wanna read down through all of these, um, but what I will say is, you know, 
the, the new CTE, uh, the technology wing, and uh, the fine arts, uh, the, the creation of a new gym, um, the, the locker rooms, uh, the cafeteria, all of, these all of these spaces have become antiquated and really not um, ideal for, for our, our teachers to, to teach in and certainly for our, our students to learn in. So again, I get really excited about this because we're, we're creating opportunities and providing the best possible learning environment uh, for our students and our staff. Joe, did you have anything you'd like to add? Just one piece, uh, the collaborative breakout spaces, when you think about 21st century learning and what students are expected to do when they're out in the workforce, they're collaborating with individuals and they're working together. And uh, this project does include collaborative spaces so that students can be accustomed to working um, in spaces that would be considered uh, industry standards. So we're certainly excited about those spaces, similar to some of the work that's been done at the high school um, in prior projects. Uh, so we're creating that opportunity for students at, at Derby Junior High School as well. The next slide shows some current conditions, which you can see uh, storage space, uh, music storage is currently being utilized in the cafeteria. That This project does expand our music space. Bathrooms are certainly uh, aged. Our gymnasium equipment space uh, and facilities and the locker room. So all of these spaces would be renovated um, to uh, today's standards uh, in, in this project. It's another example of the technology classroom. Uh, probably looks like the shop class that many of us uh, attended back in, in high school. Uh, and then our media center, uh, which again, that shift will be uh, transformative and you'll see that uh, two slides from now uh, with some outdoor space as well. There's the overall floor plan, uh, different uh, way of looking at it with the classroom spaces currently as it stands. There's the new gymnasium within the uh, one of the current courtyards. This courtyard right here will become outdoor instructional space. And you will see that uh, using this graphic. There's the new STEM classroom and media center, a view of the gymnasium. And this is all from that indoor multi-purpose courtyard uh, with uh, some instructional space and breakout space for students and staff. And before I, we turn it over to Kim, if you go up to the next slide, please. So this is, this is um, important to, to go back to. What I alluded to is um, the original project to where we are now. And Ken, please walk us through. So one of the things is that there was a lot of energy around funding the future prior to COVID. And with many things, COVID kind of took us off track a little bit. So when we first were talking to the facilities committee, and not only did COVID take us off track, but it's also escalated costs significantly, especially in the construction industry and many other areas of our lives that we deal with every day. So what this slide represents is the first column was the initial project and it compares it to what the project is that we're proposing for vote next week. So when you take a look at these slides, you can see that there no longer is an addition on Derby. Uh, the outdoor fields are no longer being impacted in regards to a turf field. If, I'm not gonna read through everyone, but I'm kind of skipping around on you. But what we did include, if funds allow us to work on our grass fields that are close to Derby. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of the spaces that we've touched. The one thing I do want to point out is there's a box that says some in it. The reason that box says some in it is because our um, facilities committee that's composed of Board of Education members, consultants, and administration took a very cl close look at this project we're proposing to ensure that if we go forward with another project, we're not going to be undoing anything that we're doing now. So for example, if anybody saw um, any of the things in the hive before, we had kind of a piece of a building that we didn't know where it was going to go. Well, if that piece of the building happens to end up on top of part of our building, that part of the roof we don't want to have renovated and then have to rip off to go up. So there's certain things that we are not going to do on purpose until we know what direction we're going, and then we can always do that in a future project. 
depending on what direction we go, if that makes sense. So really, one of the conversations when we were talking with our board is with our current financial um, situations that we really took a look at the numbers. So this is a slide that also compares the initial project that we were talking about back in December, I believe it was, and then what we're bringing forward to the taxpayers today. And one of the things that I really want to point out is that we significantly scaled back that initial project. And you can see we went from almost an $89 million project down to a $32.8 million project. This next slide really kind of takes a look at, we talked about the fact that our, our um, projects are aidable, and then there's things that may not be aidable within the project. So what this slide is really showing is that initial presentation we were giving to the board was not what we call fully aidable. Only about 63% of the entire project would have been aided at our aid rate. And these are complicated things, so I'm trying to keep it simple without confusing people as best I can. When we brought the next project back that we're bringing to the voters now that the board approved to come forward, that project, 88% of all the work done in that project is aidable. That makes a significant difference in regards to the impact on our taxpayers or that local share that's not aided. So we went from looking at a $100,000 home being impacted by $134 to $1,277. And I will point out that that is into future years. Um, that will not happen this coming year because we still, we have to have approval before we can actually have a real design, a specific design with a lot of detail in it because that costs such a large amount of money. We are not allowed to do that work with our consultants until we have approval to go forward with the project. This is the breakdown in a little different way to show you the state building aid that'll come back, the capital reserve that we have talked about a little bit tonight. That's money that we've been able to put aside to help defray part of that uh, local share that would otherwise be pushed out to the taxpayers. As I mentioned, projects take a long time, right? So we are going asking for a vote in May and you can see that this project will not be closed out for a number of years. And that's when the superintendent was speaking earlier, we're gonna be coming right back out in the near future to talk about what our next project is. And uh, there'll be more to come on that. So please come out and vote. On May 17th, we already talked about the district operations building. Uh, it's on the main campus, which was previously the transportation center before we had the opportunity to build this absolutely beautiful building that we're present in tonight. Thank you for coming. If anyone does have any questions, you're more than welcome to come up to the table. We ask you to do that, um, and I'll just remind you, is just because people at home will then be able to hear you with the mic system. So if there's any questions, please feel free to come up. And Kim, if I may add, if, if you drive home tonight and you think of any questions that you may have, please email, please email us, call, or stop by. We welcome all the, all the questions, and we, we want to provide the best answers possible so you have all the accurate and uh, all, all the information so please please reach out to us at any time please thank you if there are no questions we'll conclude thank you very much have a safe drive home